ready to go. Uh, today is Monday, June the 18th, 2018. My name is Joseph Graham. I'm a Vietnam veteran and a advocate in Verde Valley for in Verde Valley, Arizona. I'm not a Vietnam veteran. No, I am. Oh. <laughs> so we're here today to talk with a gentleman by the name of Robert B. Quinn in Cottonwood, Arizona at the Cottonwood Village. Mr. Quinn would like to know when and where you were born. When? When and where? Southwick, Massachusetts. And, and in that June 19, 2000... 1918. <laughs> 1918. So, wow. Happy birthday. Almost 100 years. Will you tell us about your parents and what they did? Your mom and dad, what did they do for... My mother and dad were split up when I was barely a year old. Okay. And uh, that was just a few years before the Depression hit. And my mother worked for the railroad. She was a stenographer, I think what they call it. And I lived with my grandmother and grandfather for quite a period of time. Yeah. My mother remarried in 1927, and my stepdad was very good to me. Yeah. He was an electrical engineer. Oh, my. And I was interested in it, and he tried to help me, but, you know, yeah. So it says here, did, did you have any brothers and sisters? Did, I have did you have any brothers and sisters? Yes, I had a brother. Oh, you did? Yeah. Old, he was... Uh, older or younger? Yeah. Was he older? No, he was younger. Younger. I think I was seven when he was born. So I think there's about seven years difference in our age. From your mom and stepfather? Mm -hmm. Okay. So a half brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically a yeah. half brother. Did he? Um, did he participate in the, in the war? Huh? Did he? Was he in the war? In yeah, war? he was over in England. He was a mechanic on the B twenty sixes. Oh my goodness! So flying's in night the, fighters. Flying's in the family. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. So, you worked for Consolidated Voltee. Mm -hmm. Now, where was Consolidated Voltee located at? San Diego, California. San Diego. Okay. And you did what for Consolidated? Huh? What did you do for Consolidated Voltee? I was a test pilot for them. Were a test pilot? Yeah. And that was, now did you test aircraft for both the Army Air Corps and the Navy? No, I was in the Army Air Corps for, uh, I believe, two and a half years. Okay, so... I taught two classes of cadets. I taught a primary class and then a basic class. How long did those last? That was probably about two years, I think. They got married. Yeah, about a, about a year and a half. But the classes themselves, how long were the classes? They take about six weeks, to really? run a, and then we get a week off. <laughs> and this and this is training people to fly liberators, yeah. the LB thirty. Huh? Was this the liberator that you were training? Oh for? no, this was a primary trainer. Oh really? That first year was with. Uh, uh, Biplane, B7, uh, PT-17. Okay. And I did, I think, two classes in that. And then they got rid of the PTs. And uh, they put me, they put us in a different airplane. It's called a Fairchild. It was a little six-cylinder inline engine. Taught quite a few cadets in that. The, uh, now, did you live... On the on the the on the base, huh? did you live on the base there? No. no. So no. you lived outside of the the yeah. factory itself. Um, so what kind of social life did you have? Did you have any social life? Well, yeah, and I came I came to Texas in 1940, and uh, I met the girl next door. <laughs> And I wound up marrying her. Oh, yeah. And um, we had a wonderful marriage. She was quite a gal. What happened to her? Huh? What happened to her? 
she died of cancer. What we, we, we were married for 31 years. So you got married during the war? Yeah. I'm trying to think. Of I went to Texas in 1941. I stayed there through the rest of 1940 and 41. And then in 1942, I went to a basic school in Brady, Texas, which is the center of Texas. And I stayed there for a year. But then I met a lot of guys that had been there that were going out to the West Coast where they were getting to fly the big airplanes. And of course, I wanted to do that. So uh, I asked, you had to get permission to leave the job because when you were under a war contract. And I asked the guy that hit me, I told him what I wanted to do. He said, well, you want to do it? That's okay, I'll release you. So I went to California. And that's and, when you went and joined Consolidated Multi? Right. Okay. Yeah. I stayed out there for six months. I couldn't take it. I mean, they had more pilots than they knew what to do with. They were on a cost plus contract. Every time I hired somebody, they got 10% more. And for, I think for about six months, I sat around in the pilot's room. I think I got about three flights out of it. And uh, on one of them, it was going back to the East Coast, and we stopped in Fort Worth. And big field there. And I went in and talked to that chief pilot. I said, I don't want to, I don't like that California group. I'd like to get back here. He was very nice, a fellow by the name of Don Dice. He was a former Delta pilot. He looked at me and we talked. He said, you think you can check out on that B-24? I said, absolutely. Then, okay, I'll arrange a transfer. And he transferred me back to uh, Fort Worth. And uh, I think within about three months, I would check out as a captain on the three B-24 test program. Now, what year was that? Uh, 42, I believe. Oh, no, wait really? a minute, 43. 43? Yeah. So, so did you continue training pilots in Texas? No. No. When I, when I went with Consolidated Volte, I was a test pilot, so I just flew production testing. And later on, they had an experimental program with an airplane called a B-32. They only built about 108 of them. And uh, when that started, I got the, they had a chief pilot out in California. He had all kinds of degrees in aeronautical engineering. He came to Fort Worth to test fly these airplanes as they were coming off the assembly line, brand new. And they actually hadn't been completely accepted by the Air Force because there were a lot of problems. So this guy was a real head on show. And uh, I was available, so the chief pilot said, why don't you go be a spoke pilot? Okay. And I flew with this engineer for probably, I would say, six months at the most. And uh, he was a really nice guy. He went on to fly the big airplanes and the jets. And I think I had some pictures of him. Very nice man. After about four or five months, he said, I'm tired of this fix it. I'm going back to California. He said, you can fly this program. So I moved over to the left seat. Nobody checked me out. I just, of course, I'd been flying with him for five or six months, so I knew all the procedures. Now, and uh, Moving the left seat meant moving the captain's seat. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then, what was it, March 10th, 1945, I had one catch fire, and uh, myself, and all the crew and myself had to bail out of it. But I was the last man out. I made sure everybody else was out. And uh, tore your, tore probably your, instrumental in saving some people's lives, I don't know. Tore your pants and ended up laying on your butt in the middle of a Texas foot. Huh? Said you tore your pants and ended oh, up... Oh, well, yeah. My parachute had some big tears in it. And unfortunately, 
I dropped a little harder. When I hit, I was going backwards, and I didn't know how to turn a parachute. There is a way to turn it. Right. And I didn't know, so I hit, and I tore the, I had a flight suit on, tore the pants off. And I had dirt in my butt. Good <laughs> Texas dirt. Because um, right. it was these big, deep cotton rows, you know, black dirt, soft. Yeah. yeah. But on the way down, I saw one other parachute. Because when I left the airplane, I was real concerned. I never saw another parachute open. And I'd give any orders and everything. And I, the, the, the six men up front, I knew they were they got out. But whether they were parachutes, because they were jumping in front of an engine, which was a bad deal. Yeah. In fact, the first one that went out, I, when he went, they went down between, there was pretty good space between the pilot and co-pilot, and there was a in the bombardiers come out. He was going down. And I grabbed him by the collar and said, You can't get out there. That prop will kill you. Well, the whole flight deck was a mass of flames. He, he just pulled away and went. And uh, all, all of them went. And the last one, uh, next to the last was uh, Doc Winchell. He was a military man. Anytime we had ammunition, we had to have a military man on board. And Doc. I was letting him fly the airplane because he's a pretty good pilot. He looked over at me and said, get out. I said, no, I'm in charge of this. You get out. He didn't argue. He got out. And I knew everybody was out and I got out. When 1945 of July, you ended up flying the Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii. Oh, I yeah. I flew from, and now it's Travis Air Force Base. I was flying for, from um, there to Hickam, and then I had si one trip down to Hickam. I went on down to um, Tarawa, stayed a couple of nights down there, and then I flew on over to Biak, New Guinea. And there was still a little bit of war going on there because when I get landed and got out of the airplane, one of the military men came up and said, i give you a little bit of advice, stay close to the home headquarters. He says, those hills are full of snipers. And he said, we've lost a few people because of they wander away from the base. Want to explore, and it's understandable, but yet uh, it was dangerous. So I made it in and out of there okay. What, now, how did you get from um, Texas to go to Hickam Air Force Base? What was, was there a mission that you were No, the company, the company transferred me. Oh, really? Because they lost the contract on this experimental bomber. So the head on show called me in and he said, you know, um, we can't keep you out of the draft anymore. <laughs> he said, uh, we do have space for you if you want to go fly the Pacific. I said, anything to stay out of the walking army, <laughs> you know. And so they transferred me to the California division. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and then you went, this last flight to uh, yeah. Hickam and then down to uh, down to Riyak, yeah. Tara, Tarawa, New Guinea. Um, did you, well obviously you had a lot of friendships and, and relationships with different people through the, the course of Well, the, yeah, you know, and I think most of them are gone. Is it? Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, the trip that I made down at Tarawa and Biak, I can't remember who the crew members were. Because I had just re gotten out there and I didn't know any of the pilots out right. there. So I can't remember what their names were. But you had the same crew that went from Hickam yeah. to... I know. Uh, I was very fortunate because uh, they gave me time off to go to Fort Worth to get my wife and I came back and uh, on the way back the war ended. So when I got to Saint, uh, Hickam, wherever it was, in, in the States rather, it was Travis, I said, I'm retiring, I'm quitting. And the chief pilot said, no, you can't do that. We got you set up for a trip to Australia. I said, forget it. Oh man, where are we? The war's over, I said. Yeah, but he said, we got a lot of stuff to do yet. But anyway, I did quit. And that's, I went to work for, 
American Airlines as a first officer for about a year, I think. And then they start cutting back because they were getting DC-6s that could carry what three DC-3s carried. So they were laying off a bunch of crews. I later got called back, but I ignored it. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah. You, now, I said, do you, do you, do you, well, obviously, most of the people that you flew with have since passed away, right? Huh? Most of the people you flew with have passed away. Yeah. In fact, uh, I've been on the internet here a little bit on this birthday, and people are calling me and tell me, no, he's not here anymore. Wow. Yeah. Well, you're, you're fortunate to get where you are. Now, do you belong to any veteran organizations? No. But, well, you're the VA medical, you're in... Yeah, you well... You've got that. And, um, what have you done, or what did you do after the war was over? Well, when the war was over, I worked for uh, American for a year, and then I got furloughed. So I hung around the airport there in Fort Worth. <laughs> I never will forget, it was a guy, he was an Irishman, and he'd been a test pilot with me over the other day. And I run into him in this little terminal building, and I said, he said, what are you doing? I said, nothing, I'm looking for a job. He said, I got you one. <laughs> what do you want? He said, see that? Airplane out there, it's a Spartan executive, belongs to an oil company. I said, what about it? He said, how about flying it up to up to uh, Oklahoma City for me? Okay, so we're walking out the airplane, and I said, you're going to check me out and give me, do a landing? He looked at me and said, for Christ's sake, you know how to fly a damn airplane, don't you? <laughs> I said, did it insure it? He said, yeah. I said, good. <laughs> so I flew that up though. But shortly thereafter, I went to Houston. I didn't, yeah, it was very short. I wasn't out of work, but about a couple of weeks. There was an airline in Houston that was forming. And I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was called uh, Pioneer Airlines. Mm. They flew DC-3s. And I went down there and I got hired in with them. And I worked for them for about six months, but there was another airline starting up. And the chief pilot of that airline was a pretty good friend of mine. I'd known him down in the South Pacific for quite a while. And uh, I knew they were getting DC-3s and I knew they were getting them from American Airlines. And American, they their airplanes, were the same, but the instrumentation and the heating and it was totally different. They had their own group of engineers. So I went down there and talked to him one day and he gave me an application and I thought probably it wasn't in the circular file, but I was back at the airport about a week or two later and they, he and another guy flew this DC-3 in that they bought up in Oklahoma. I think they paid they paid about $2,700 for these old, and they had a lot of time, thirty and 40,000 hours on them. Oh my goodness. And he saw me after he got out of the airplane. Come over here. He said, uh, did you go to American Airlines school? I said, yeah. He said, I can't figure out some of the crap in that airplane. I said, well, if you want, I'll get up there. And I talked him through all the systems. He said, well, you know the airplane pretty good, don't you? I said, yeah. I said, Can I, do I get a job here? He said, uh, yeah. He said, I got two guys I've already hired because I've known them for a long time and they're out of work, but you'll be our number three captain. What, air, what airline was that? Texas Airlines. Trans Texas Airways. Yeah. TTA. T Tree Top Airlines. <laughs> Boy, you talk about a wild bunch. <laughs> Once in a while we'd have one or two passengers, most of the time. All we had was mail, because this was uh, being operated by a man that owned a flight school in Houston, and he was getting these uh, federal contracts, and uh, so it, it, it continued to grow constantly. I think we wound up with eight of American Airlines airplanes. I had one one night, 
I was flying from Fort Worth to San Angelo, and about halfway down, I lost the right engine. It, I looked down and with a light in it, and I could see one of the cylinders bouncing around in the cowling down there. So I had to shut it down. We flew for pretty about two hours on one engine. Uh, I was going to stop at Brownwood. That was one of our stops. And we had a little ADF beacon down there. It was very weak. And I made two approaches to it. You're only supposed to go down to 400 feet if you don't see it. The second one, I cheated a little bit. I went down about three hundred and see a darn thing. And, <laughs> and I pulled out of there, and I'm put, climbing out on one engine, you know. And I told the guy down there, I said, I'm going back to Fort Worth. Because they got an instrument landing and everything back there. So all in all, it took about two hours, and I got back to uh, Fort Worth. And I remember there was a Delta inbound. And the controller asked Delta, would you hold... We have a man on an emergency here in the Delta. I said, oh yeah, sure. And after I landed, this Delta captain came. He was a real old man. I'm a young kid. He said, you did a wonderful job. <laughs> well, yeah, for two hours. I, I, kept, I kept hearing that good engine falling apart. Oh, when it quits, I'm gone. <laughs> but it's, it stayed together. Let me, t let me just take you back real quick here. How did the... How did your participation in the war? Huh? How did the, your participation in 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 the war affect your feelings? Well, I mean, I was like everybody else. You, you read the newspapers and you saw how bad the situation was in Europe, and then it was in in uh, the South Pacific. And you know, I was real happy that I was at least in it. You know what message would you leave for future generations? Be loyal to your country. And this is the best one in the world. Yep. Yep. I would agree with that. Robert, we thank you for your service to our country. And we thank you well, for this interview. You know, when that war broke out, I remember men were lined up volunteering. Most of them wanted to get in because uh, if you got it, if you volunteered, you could pick the service you wanted. If you were drafted, you went wherever they sent you. Right. Yeah. And I think I had a wonderful career, and uh, I enjoyed my work so much. And I think maybe that's why I lived so long. <laughs> could you know? be. Yeah. They say if you if you get paid for. For doing what is it? How does that go? The adage about if you if you you work at something you like, you'll never really be at work. Huh? That's okay. I said if you if you really enjoy what you like, you'll never never have to worry about working. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Robert. Uh, when I went to work for that flying school in Fort Worth, right? I was a year and a half teaching students. They paid us 300 bucks a month. It was a pretty good job. And after every six weeks we got through a class, we'd get a week off. A lot of people owe their lives to you for what you did. So, well done. Thank you again. That's me. How old? How old were you in this one photograph that we've got? 21. Were you 21 then? Now what, what about what about the that photograph? Yeah, that'd be about the same year. Twenty one also. Yeah. Look like uh, look like a uh, movie star. I think I instructed there till I was twenty two. Yeah. When you started flying, when did you get your private pilot's license? Was it nineteen thirty nine? No. No. I got my private pilot's license in 1942. Oh, in 42? I think so, yeah. But weren't you flying in 1939? Uh, 1939. 
I was still, I think I was still flying in the little airport in Westfield, Massachusetts. I got your flight log. Yeah, I'm trying to build up enough time. Oh, okay. Yeah. 39, yeah. <laughs> what? Okay.